guys we are Clinton Carey Gifford um, we're two of the co-pastors for the Avengers and um, Nate asked us to give an update on kind of what's been going on in our lives over the past several months um, so about three months ago three months ago we uh, started the journey of uh, trying to figure out what God was calling us into next as far as my work um, and so we started praying through that and looking at some different options with some different things um, and really began to, to seek him pretty heavily and so she talked to her sister um, about a month and a half ago and immediately um, became evident that uh, uh, we may have some opportunities in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, so we spent about three weeks up there, um, two weeks ago, I guess. We, we were up there for three weeks and came back two weeks ago and uh, really had a pretty interesting time spiritually and, <laughs> and <laughs> emotionally um, up there. Um, I had the opportunity to work at two different places, um, which was a pretty, pretty special gift from the Lord to be able to, to try jobs on before you are hired for them, um, was pretty amazing. Um, but one of the, I guess one of the things that stuck out the most from that time was for me personally, um, 
never having really walked through this process as a husband and as a father, um, I really struggled with um, some aspects of it. I struggled with some emotions that I didn't expect. Um, of you know, not not feeling confident in my abilities with the work that I was doing, um, not feeling like I was, like Raleigh was a good fit for us, even though God was really opening up all the doors there. Um, really missing Greenville and missing people in Greenville just in the three weeks we were there, which surprised me. Um, and so it was a, a really interesting time for me, um, spiritually, and she was really instrumental in speaking a lot of truth in that time um, and showing me just just the truth about who I am um, to God and who I am in his kingdom and what he has blessed me with and gifted me with but also who he is in the bigger picture who he is and how he has taken care of us and how he has never let us falter or fail as a family. It was really a neat experience for me to be able to step in to things and um, in, in some ways kind of have our usual roles reversed in that Clint is usually the pillar um, of the family Anyone who knows him wouldn't be surprised to hear that. Um, and he's usually the one that's so much quicker to jump on speaking truth and remembering what is true versus what um, feelings are and what reality is. And um, it's just, it's always been neat in the moments during our marriage where. I have had the opportunity to step in and be that for him in whatever capacity. Um, and so this time around, it was, it was a little unexpected to the extent that things were um, being experienced for him, um, but it was really special and very unique situation in that we were in a, a place that wasn't familiar during a time that is unprecedented with COVID. And so everything just felt really disorienting and strange. I think there was just a lot of self-doubt for him and a lot of pressure um, and stress and fears. And it was really um, humbling to be able to kind of come in and speak truth into his mind and his heart and remind him what is true and in and, and that we don't do things by our own strength and that's what that's not what God calls us to do and that's not what he wants us to do because when we do those things and we, we do things that are not with him and of our own um, abilities we're not living true to who he's called us to be and he wants us to rely on him and during those times and rely on his strength um, and also lean into our weaknesses and I think that was a large part of what I was um, God was showing me so that I could share with him in that um, let, don't try to run away from what's going on or from these feelings um, but let's sit and, and, and lean into them and see how is it that God wants to use this, how can he use this to um, help him grow, help us grow together um, to gain glory for himself. And I think it was a really sweet time for us to be reminded that God is glorified through our weaknesses and that that's a beautiful thing and it's not something that we should shy away from or um, it's so easy to do that it's so easy to pray for 
um, relief during times of um, dismay or fears or just any kind of situation that is uncomfortable and I think something that the Lord was challenging me with was rather than praying for things to get better or for things to, to be more clear than they were seeming to be at the time um, or for some sort of solution that was going to relieve us of feeling the stress or relieve him from feeling all these things. It was more an immediate um, thought that, I, that the Lord brought to my mind of like, he and I need to sit and just sit in this together and in some ways embrace it. And there was one specific morning before he went off to the tattoo shop that he was guest spotting at. Um, we were able to take some time and sit down and there's a liturgy that I had read um, the day before that I wanted to share with him and it was based on um, fear of failure and it was so beautiful and so timely and the Lord really used that so we sat together and Clint read it out loud and we sat with it um, and just exactly what I had said just a reminder in that is God not so good that he would use our weaknesses to help us grow and to help um, shine light on who he is and how good he is um, and so just helped bring us back to give us some perspective and um, I think that was the morning things really turned for him um, he was able to have really good conversation with the Lord on his own um, and truth and perspective was brought back and that was really the turning point for him and um, he had his last week there at the shop and long story short they um, offered him a position to tattoo full time for the first time in his career really um, and so after a lot of prayer and just a lot of really seeing God working and clearly answering prayer and it's just been pretty undeniable on his uh, quickness to answer our prayers and clarity on that um, we've decided to take the leap yeah so we uh, we will be officially leaving Greenville um, on August 5th um, which is exciting and scary and sad and joyful um and all uh, all those emotions you would expect it to be um she's lived in greenville for 10 years the better part of 10 years i've lived here for 22 years um and one of the things there, there are a lot of hard aspects to it but one of the hardest aspects to it is the thought of leaving y'all um of leaving the radius body um we know that there are so many great um, expressions of the body of Christ all over, um, and there's a lot of great ones in Raleigh, and we, we fully expect the Lord to lead us to a place where we can serve and worship and grow and um, take the skills that we've gained um, through Radius, through the teaching, through being co-pastors, and you know, really dive into some, some new things in a new place. Uh, but at the same time, there's just, there, there's some, there's definitely some sadness that we have to leave you guys. Um, uh, even, even when it means going to a really great opportunity, um, it's hard to leave the comfort of, of intimacy with the body of Christ like we and especially I have experienced um, with Radius over the past 12 or 13 years that I've been there. Um, yeah, we, we really love you guys and we will miss you. We hope we get to see some of you at least before we leave. Um, but um, yeah, so. Yeah, we love you guys and we're incredibly humbled to be on this journey with the Lord and just taking the leap and taking one day at a time with him so yeah
Thanks for letting us share with yep. you. Happy Sunday. Happy Sunday. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another Radius Gathering. Today, uh, we're utilizing the light board, uh, which I'll be writing on in just a minute. If you are used to doing blueprint, you've seen this before. It's not anything crazy, um, but we do use it uh, for visual kind of stuff every once in a while. So I thought we would just, you know, change it up a bit. So welcome to the light board. Uh, we are going to be in Acts chapter 7 today. If you want to go ahead and turn there, you can. We're going to finish up talking about the story of Stephen. And before we do, just a quick quick encouragement to you. Uh, we as a staff, especially, we're going to be pushing through the rest of the month of July some uh, more focused encouragement around the gospel itself. And the reason why is, I mean, it's always good. I shouldn't have to give a reason why, but the reason why is because uh, it's one of our five values. It's our core first value of the five to be a gospel-centered disciple. And we recognize that, you know, we're in a season where we as Radius are more decentralized than normal. We're a, a, a a movement that has decentralization and these centralized gatherings. We highly value both, but because of the COVID, uh, we're having to really push back against a lot of the, the bigger stuff, the bigger meetings and things like that, obviously. So we believe, though, those, those times are so valuable for us to be encouraging each other in the gospel, speaking the truth of Jesus' love for each one of us in those settings. So um, in, in lieu of that, we're going to be offering uh, more you know, traffic through social media, media, through Blueprint, through Realm, whatever we can, that, that deals with gospel encouragement. And so you'll be seeing more of that the next few weeks in July, because uh, we want to just, just really ensure that we are all surrounded by the reality of God's uh, never-ending love for each one of us. And this is a season, you know, in terms of society, where that's very, very important, you know, to be drinking from that living water. So uh, we're in positions now where, you know, we're having to, to think about things we'd have to think about a year ago. We're in a society that is more divisive than it, than it was at least, uh, you know, above ground a year ago. And this weighs on us, you know, as human beings, it weighs on us to hear conflict and more conflict and unknowns and uncertains and all this stuff. It just weighs on you. And if you don't have a way to push back against all that outward pressure with an internal, robust, uh, gospel message that just speaks life and truth and identity into yourself, then each day is going to feel like a, a never ending battle, a never winning battle. You know, you're, you're just going to feel like you're uphill, climbing uphill all the time. Whereas the gospel, picks you up out of that stuff and goes, hey, let, let, let the Lord just speak to you and tell you who you are in Him, who He is for you and to you. And these truths, I mean, they, they are so giant. They just, they, 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 they put, they put out to the back burner all of the other things that are happening that are still valuable, still important, but they give us perspective that if the God of the universe speaks things into our hearts and our minds and our souls, these things hold tremendous weight. And so I want to give you, for whatever it's worth, permission to take as much time and to create as much discipline in your life each day, each week, around just sitting before the Lord and letting the gospel become real to you. We call it gospeling, right? It's just gospeling to yourself, letting Jesus gospel to you, you gospeling to others, just not taking a season with this much turmoil and, and missing the shot to be able to go, listen, I, I want to be known through the, this rest of 2020 as somebody who, who sits deeply in my identity in Christ. And so we as staff, we want to contribute to this uh, idea of making sure that we are filling one another up with the truth of the gospel. And so uh, for me personally, I've been taking more increased time in the mornings. I've been taking a, a, a section of a day each week the last few weeks and just ensuring that I am just, I'm just with Jesus, you know? I mean, not, not a lot of what, what next? You know, where do we go? Who do I help? More like, how do I become so uh, filled with your spirit, so filled with your love, right, that, that I have something to offer the world around me? So if you're uh, the kind of person who uh, benefits from that, which a lot of us do, then uh, keep your ears open, eyes open for what we'll be putting out more uh, more through um, the Radius um, communication vehicles. So we're going to look at Acts uh, chapter 7. 
I'm going to read it for us, and then we're going to pray and see what the Lord kind of reveals even as we prepare our hearts to kind of talk through some ideas I'll be presenting uh, as far as, you know, some interpretations, applications of Acts 7. Uh, before we do, let me give you a little bit of a setup in case you haven't joined us the last two weeks. Uh, we are talking about Stephen, and we're talking about a guy who is uh, madly in love with Jesus. And what has happened is he has been teaching the ways of Jesus, living the ways of Jesus, and in doing so, he's created some offense. Uh, it, it, kind of, it kind of tends to happen this way. You follow Jesus, you talk about the things of Jesus, the world may respond in an offensive kind of a nature, meaning that, you know, the gospel, it is a divisive uh, teaching, right? I mean, it's a teaching about life to the fullest. And when you teach about life to the fullest, you're also saying all other forms of living aren't as full, right? And it teaches about truth. Jesus says he's the, he's the truth, you know? So that means every other thing you're basing your life on isn't true. And so what you find in at least this case and in many cases in the Bible, that when the gospel is presented fully, you know, uh, as if it's the holistic gospel of Jesus being a Lord, a Savior, and a King, that when people are grasping other things, right, and they're going, yeah, but I value this, my life's around this. And some of these things they may be grasping because they believe it's what God wants. But if, when they're confronted with the truth of what God wants, it can create a, a very offensive response because what they hear is not, hey, let go of this and grab hold of this, and this is so much better. Jesus is so much better. What they hear is what I'm grabbing onto is not something I can find myself easily letting go of. You know, my identity is intertwined in that. My future, my hopes, my dreams are inter intertwined in these things that I value or I practice or I characterize myself as. And so this can feel very painful and, 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 and very offensive. And you find that these people uh, that Stephen is, is preaching the gospel to, or are going to have to make a decision. Do they listen to the gospel and do they go, we're in, or do they listen to the gospel and feel offended? So we'll pick up in verse 54, which will quickly let us know how they feel. We're going to read this and then pray and see what the Lord does. Um, when the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious. <laughs> they were furious. They gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, <clears throat> full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears, yelling at the top of their voices. They all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. Let's pray. Let's see what the Lord has to say to you and to me as we seek him. Uh, Jesus, we um, press into you right now, and we believe that these words from Scripture are inspired by you and can have great benefit into each one of our lives. Whatever situations are at hand, whatever frustrations we feel, whatever things that are going on that are um, painful to us, we believe you can use your word and the truth of your word to affect amazing change, to invite us to amazing vision in our lives. So we want to sit before you. We want to trust you right now to lead us and guide us. Lord, as you reveal to us right now who we are and what we're going through, the things that we want to hide and run away from, the things that the enemy would tell us, you know, Stephen's story isn't relevant. <laughs> would you make us aware through that revelation right now? What are we going through? What are we facing right now in our lives that we desperately need your word to speak into? And could you use this story in Acts chapter 7, this, this one little section of text to speak truth and life into areas of darkness, confusion in our lives. Jesus, we love you. And we thank you for the privilege of studying your word together. Amen. So, <clears throat> the Sanhedrin are not exactly lined up to get baptized, okay? They are, they're frustrated. They're gnashing their teeth, Arr, like they're furious. They do not like what's being taught because it is, it is it's calling them away from what they've learned to grab hold of and grasp. 
as they look at Stephen, um, they, the, the clear indication here is they're not for him. They're not for the Christ that he is speaking about. They're, they want him done. They want him to stop speaking. Right? They want him finished. Verse 55. Stephen knows what's coming. And Stephen says, uh, it says, But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. So you have this moment where you've got this, let's say, 71 you know, Sanhedrin. That's, if it's the greater Sanhedrin, that's the number. They have 71 judges. They're sitting in a half circle around Stephen. Stephen's just done his thing, and now they're not biting on. They're not grabbing hold of it. So Stephen now looks up, and he has this moment where he sees God, sees the glory of God, sees Jesus. So I'm going I'm to write this up here. I'm going to write the phrase, see Jesus. And I want to con- uh, contemplate on this for a few minutes together with you and really think about what this means. So first, let's, let's start with this conversation. Um, have you ever had a, a, a moment where you read a news story, read an article about a pastor, or maybe a, a worship singer, uh, an author, who you would have thought they're pretty solid with Jesus. You would have thought by the things that they're saying, the things that they're doing, these people seem to be like game on with Jesus. They seem to really love God. But then what, what you read this story about how they've abandoned the faith. They don't believe in God anymore. They're done with the church. They're finished. They look back and, and as they characterize their life previous to this, they, they talk about how it was fake. They talk about how they just were involved in religion and they were doing things for other motivations, but God wasn't there. Like God disappointed them in some way and just didn't show up quite as, quite as much. Now, do you ever hear those stories or even hear me say that now and never look at your life, maybe you do in this moment, and think, you know, I don't know how solid I am with God in this moment. Like, I don't know if the right number of variables presented themselves if I wouldn't also abandon Jesus. You know, if the right type of suffering came, the right kind of difficulty came, um, you know, it just, you just got to be more of the mundane. It's got to be more of just a regular routine life. I don't know that I, wouldn't, I couldn't see myself leaving the faith, right? Leaving Jesus, not being around Him anymore. Maybe uh, you look back over a time years ago and you, th- you think, I was more passionate about Jesus before I was married, before I took this job, before this difficulty and suffering came my way. So maybe in this moment right now, you feel like, I, I'd really do anything for some kind of a, a boost, some kind of something that would allow me to have a fervent, vibrant passionate relationship with Jesus that would be so strong, I couldn't imagine leaving Him. be so real, I couldn't imagine my life not being around Him. So I want you to imagine, what if right now, right now, you walked outside to your backyard, to the parking lot, wherever you are, you walk outside. I want you to imagine, what if you look up and for 60 seconds, the sky just sort of opens up you know, like Avengers style, you know, those little portals, you know, it just kind of opens up and, and you're looking through this window. And in this window, you have a clear shot, clear visual uh, depiction of a live, through the window, live look at the fullness of the glory of God. You are looking at God, <laughs> you know, real time. This is, this, here's God, here's you. I mean, he's, he's, you know, you're just looking, right. he's 50 feet away. The window is right there and he is 50 feet away. You could throw a stick at him. You wouldn't want to throw a stick at him, but you could throw a stick at him. And so you're looking right at him and then right beside him is Jesus, the, the one who holds the name that identifies, you know, I'm a Christian, Christ, there he is. And you're staring right at him them, right? Him. They, they're staring at you. They're looking at you and you are having this intense moment where visually it all checks out. It's all very, very thick with reality, you know, and you even, you even look away for a second, right? And you kind of look down and you're like, okay, I am, I'm still here, right? And I'm still, still here. I'm still alive. And so you look around and you, you look at your watch, you know, it's still the same time it was a minute ago before you walked out. You're like, that's not, you look around, you see everything around you. It's where it's supposed to be. So you fixate back on this window and you're like, this is the most realist, real thing I have ever felt. You know, I'm looking at the living God. I'm looking at 
actual Jesus in this moment. Then within 60 seconds, let's say that window closes. What does your life look like the next hour, the next day, maybe the next month, because of this 60 second experience, seeing with your own eyes, Jesus, fully Jesus, what does, what does this do to your life? How would you live differently the next hour? Let me just throw out maybe a, a guess as you're processing this. What would, what would you do like the next hour after, you, after the 60 second Jesus window? <laughs> like, what would you do? Is it possible that you would boldly proclaim what you have just seen? I mean, think about it. Is that, is that what you would do? Would you, would you go, I'm, I'm telling everybody. I mean, would you find yourself, after you see Jesus, kind of move into a place of, of boldly proclaiming, boldly proclaiming that what you have just seen in Jesus? Where you go, I, I saw him, <laughs> and I want to tell you what I saw. Would there be this sensation where you, you just want to like go around and kind of like grab people that are kind of like living very average, you know, lukewarmy kind of Christian lives and go like, yo, for real. You know what I mean? I saw him. It's all real. It's all totally legit. It really is. I had a live window into Jesus and you would boldly proclaim that thing. Now, what about tomorrow? Tomorrow, would you imagine maybe that as, as you went to go start your day and plan your day and live any kind of way, how would you live differently if you saw Jesus the day before? Is it possible that you would look at your life and you would say, you know what, I, from here on out, <laughs> I, can't, I can't help but being, I, I wanna be filled, uh, filled by the Spirit. I wanna be filled with the Spirit. I want the Spirit to be, to be filling me. I want, I want that to be what really is my deal now. Why? Because I have seen the living Jesus. You know what I mean? And I'm going to walk around just completely just excited by the Holy Spirit in me from now on. Now, let's go a month from now. A month from now. What, what would your life maybe overall, of course, it would hopefully keep these things in play, but a month from now, what would it look like? Uh, I wonder if you would say, or wonder if any of us would say, you know, man, a month later, I would, I would think because I saw Jesus in such a real, tangible, physical way, all the doubt was removed, I got to see him, maybe you would characterize yourself a month from now as somebody who has Jesus at the center. You, you now live this life where, where life becomes, everything's about Jesus. Why? Because you saw him. You saw him. Like, and now you have this idea of going, I want everything to be about Jesus at the center of my life, about who he is at the center. I want, if I'm going to eat something, go somewhere, do something, say something, I want it to be about Jesus. Why? Because I've seen him. I've seen him. And he matters so incredibly much to me. Now here's what I want to say. This, this, I'm just kind of making up a flow chart here. I could have made this up a bunch of different ways, but however I make it up, this progression of things that change because we see Jesus, I want to point out how different that Stephen's life was from this concept. Stephen's life was reverse of this. You see, in, in, in his idea, it wasn't, it, he didn't have an idea of after I see Jesus, my life is changed. In, G, in Stephen's deal, he seems to put Jesus at center from the beginning. In faith, he puts his faith on in Jesus, and Jesus becomes the centerpiece of his life. That's not because Jesus reveals himself physically, not because Jesus does anything that is visual before Stephen. It's just that Stephen believes the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ without having to see anything necessarily. Now, it's possible Stephen did meet Jesus and see Jesus, but we don't have any text that alludes to that. So we're going to assume that Stephen just simply heard the gospel and believed in Jesus. And when he believed, he put Jesus at that moment as the center of his life. To whatever degree he had the ability to offer himself to Jesus, he gave himself to Jesus. And so this, because Jesus becomes at center, Jesus then gives him the Holy Spirit, and, and Stephen lives a life where he's named several times, described several times as being filled with the Spirit. The Spirit fills Stephen. And so as he's filled with the Holy Spirit, this filling of the Spirit allows him 
to boldly proclaim truths about Jesus. In his bold proclamation that happens in Acts chapter 6, as a result of that, that's why he sees Jesus. You see, sometimes we want Jesus to physically represent himself so we can begin this this transformation of like really being sold out. And Jesus reverses it and goes, I want you to really be sold out. And as you're sold out to me, as you're sold out to my love for you, I want your life to be filled with me so that you you will be the kind of person that in this age or the next, you will see me in due time. So the question is, why does Stephen get to see Jesus? in this age. Why does this happen? I'm not sure, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speculate here uh, quite a bit, and I'm going to take a, a little bit of a guess. And I'm going to simply guess this. I wonder if the reason Jesus reveals himself to Stephen is because he has seen somebody, the first follower of his, to, <clears throat> that hasn't been necessarily physically present with Jesus before, he has seen one of the first followers of his actually get this thing in order. And in doing that, he sees somebody who loves Jesus for who Jesus is, who loves Jesus because it's, it's, it's motivated by faith, who allows Jesus to be the Lord, Savior, and King without needing proof after proof after proof. He's just madly in love with Him. And I wonder if the reason Jesus gives him the gift of revelation, of a quick, physical, momentary, hey, here I am, Stephen, isn't because Stephen needs it. It's because, it's because Jesus wants to give it. You know, And so here would be the only loose thing I would grab at to speculate in that way. I want you to look at so many other times when Jesus is described throughout the New Testament. I'll read this list of verses for you. Matthew 26, verse 64. From now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power. Where is Jesus? Seated at the right hand of the Father. Mark 16, verse 19. So then the Lord Jesus, after He had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. Where is Jesus? Sitting at the hand of the Father, right hand of the Father. Ephesians 1, verse 20. He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places. Where is Christ? He's seated at the right hand of the Father. Hebrews 1, verse 3. After making purification for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Hebrews 8, verse 1. One who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. Hebrews 10, verse 12. When Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Hebrews 12, verse 2, he is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. When Stephen sees Jesus, Jesus is not seated. He is standing. He is standing. What does this mean? We don't, we don't know. But I want to throw, a, throw something at you, very speculative, I know, but to say that what if what's happening here isn't Stephen saying, if I could only see Jesus, then? What if we have is somebody who has already given faith over to Jesus and is living in such a way that the Father sees Jesus, His Son, get up out of His seat for joy and say, Stephen, gets it. Like, Stephen gets me. Stephen understands that this is not about what you see, not about what you feel, not about the physical earth around you and how it, like, how the winds blow for you or against you circumstantially. Stephen understands who I am and what my kingdom is about. And I wonder, just wondering here, if the Father sees the Son get up in just excitement, standing up and going, yes, like He loves me the way I love Him. And I just wonder if the Father, just almost as a overwhelmed in joy for what the Son is experiencing, watching somebody in human flesh live by the Spirit, live boldly proclaiming truth. I wonder if the Father, just as a gift to both Jesus and Stephen, goes, boop, y'all take a quick look at each other. Y'all hang out for 60 seconds. I I don't know. I don't know what mobilizes this, what motivates this. I don't know what causes it. But 
it doesn't seem that Stephen was begging for it or asking for it or even necessarily needed it. It seemed to be such a precious gift of the Father to say, well done, Stephen. I want you to know how much joy you are creating in the kingdom of heaven by your ability to stay the course and allow Jesus to be who Jesus wants to be for you. Well, we don't know. We don't know now. We may talk to Stephen one day and him go like, uh, it was a little different than that. Or Jesus may say it was a little different than that. But I, I wonder, you know, just, just wondering and thinking, because this is certainly how, G- how Stephen's life seems to work. And yet the enemy, I think, wants us to go this way. So we need to process that, right? And ask the Lord, am I waiting to see Jesus to somehow make my faith in Him, somehow my boldness in Him, the Spirit's use of my life, is that going to somehow change or grow if I were to see Jesus tomorrow? Because if so, just know Jesus Himself says we are blessed if we have faith in Him without having to see Him. So if we hinge our passion for God upon physical circumstances working their their way out uh, physically around us, something's different in what Stephen's doing and how he's living. Let's go forward a little bit. Verse 57. At this, they covered their ears, and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him. They dragged him out of the city. They began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord, receive my spirit. I want to offer up another word right here that actually is the word offer. I want to just leave this word here for us for a moment, just just to meditate on. Stephen's life... was offered to God. It wasn't taken. It wasn't taken by Pharisees, Sadducees, uh, Sanhedrin. It wasn't taken by religious leaders that wanted to end his life. His life was offered. He offered his life. Now, would it have been taken anyway? Yes, (laughs) that's not the question. The question is, was was Stephen ready to die? Was Stephen willing to die? Was, Was Stephen offering up himself. You know, we're in a culture right now where death is being discussed all the time. I mean, how many times have you either seen or had to look away from the last few minutes of of George Floyd's life from last month? How many times have you seen videos across news feeds right now of police officers losing their lives the last few months, specifically as a result of people um, responding or or rioting against what happened to George Floyd? How many times have you looked at graphs of death rates because of COVID? How many times have you had to think and process the concept of death because of the culture, where we are right now and how everybody is talking right now? The idea here is that life is just a vapor. We're not going to be here forever. But there's something that Stephen was able to master that's available for all of us. And that's the ability to understand that in the face of the inevitable conclusion that our bodies will cease to exist, whether it's COVID, whether it's a wreck, whether it's lightning, whether it's some other disease, all of our bodies are going to cease to exist. Whether Jesus comes back first And we leave these bodies one way or another. The physical body that you take hold of right now, it's not going to last forever. It's not intended to last forever by the way the kingdom is coming, by the way what Jesus wants to do is give us resurrected bodies. And yet we live in a culture that part of the American dream is to sort of try to push life out to be as long as it can. Right? We, we want to preserve youth. We want to stay young. We don't want to move towards death. We don't want to invite the possibility of the end of this life because we, we, we want to just maximize everything about it because of the, the American dream. But the American dream, you know, the idea of like life and prosperity and all these things, the idea is they're sometimes misdefined. And what quality means in life sometimes doesn't match what kingdom quality is. So for Stephen... The idea of his life is he's not trying to preserve his life to any particular age as much as he is to live fully with the life that he's been given by God, to use it at the highest quality for the kingdom of God. And when the time comes for his life to be over at the hands of Sadducees or Sanhedrin, at the hands of of some other disease or something that could have gotten him, the point is when Stephen's time is up and he senses his time is up, Instead of reacting in fear or in you know, anxiety, he reacts by going in his own way, Lord, um, 
you're in charge of death. You're in charge of life. And if this is how I'm supposed to go, this is when I'm supposed to go. Steve is not trying to control the how or the when. He's just trying to control what's in his control, and that is the ability to freely offer his life up to the Lord of life in the right moment at the right time. And that time, that moment is set by God. And so when Stephen finds himself at a crossroad where he's not going to make it out alive, he's able to demonstrate a type of trust in Jesus that will, we will probably never be able to, to, to have more trust in Jesus tangibly than we will with our physical life. To be able to say, my life, I hand to you, Jesus. Do with it what you will. We can have COVID graphs, we can have fear, we can have all kinds of things around us, but the ability in our last few seconds or in the face of any type of thing that could affect our life or our death, the ability to freely say to God, into your hands, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Lord, receive my spirit. The same things Jesus was able to say to the Father, Stephen is able to say to the Father. To say, receive my spirit, I freely give it to you, God. I'm not picketing this. I'm not protesting this. I'm saying, Jesus, I trust you. And if now is my time to go, now is my time to go. To do this, you have to have an eternal perspective. To do this, you have to have something other than a worldly perspective. And this is, to, this is difficult. To view our lives is not the timeline that we get, this vapor that we get as being at all, but to view our lives as being an eternal timeline. And the idea that one day, the version of us a million years from now might look back at this little timeline we have, this little vapor on earth, and, and actually give us, you know, uh, I, we might look back on this season and go, wow, wish, wish we had had more of the eternal perspective. It's possible in Christ, and Stephen seems to have it. The way I think about sometimes eternal perspectives, I think about the number of things in my life that were really big deals. Like, I thought they were going to be life-changing big deals in the moment. And then to have lived more life after that, bless God, that He's allowed me to live as long as I have, to be able to now have time under my belt and go back and go, wow, that thing back then was really big. Like I'll give you an example. This is a this is an awkward one. But when I was uh, like in was what sixth grade, uh, going into sixth grade, seventh grade, uh, I had this uh, girlfriend. Okay, and so whatever it means to have a girlfriend back then, I don't really know. I think you basically. I think I just wrote a note saying, "Do you want to be my girlfriend?" She checks the box, yes, no, or maybe. This particular one checked yes, and so now we're boyfriend girlfriend. You know, and so that lasted about three weeks. You know, uh, her name was Kathy. All right, and so Kathy and I were boyfriend girlfriend in elementary school for three whole weeks this involved uh no dating no going out anywhere just a whole lot of like late night phone calls where we didn't even say very much but three weeks into it i can remember vividly this moment we were about to go back into school and i was about to go to a middle school she would have still been in elementary school and we have the talk on the phone where she says i just don't know you're you're so much older than me i was a year older than her um, and I just don't know, you're going to be at a different school with older people and maybe we should just break up. <laughs> and so she's a little bit upset, but my heart just stops. I'm like, oh, no, you know, and so we, we break up on the phone and I hang up and I am crying, right? In, 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 in sixth grade, I am crying because my romantic future is done. You know, I remember like, like just running through the house and my, my family was waiting for me to watch a movie. I was like, I just can't, you know? And so I go in and I run over and I, and I grab a, 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 like the, the shower in my mom's room and I take a shower for like two hours by myself because I'm not coming out of here, you know? And like, you know, I'm just like, who even needs the faucet to produce water? I'm producing my own. I'm just crying, crying, crying because my future has been altered because this three week relationship is now over. And so I'm playing like Richard Marx, you know, and the saddest songs I can find that were the, the good old fashioned, you know, 80s and 90s, like love ballads of heartbrokenness and the end of romance. And so, I, I mean, I, I'm exaggerating, but not by much. Like if, if I went back and found me in that moment, I was, everything was just dark and it was just, uh, and how am I gonna get through it? So now I've been married for 20 years right? And, um, and I've been married, I've been happily married for 20 years. And if I could go back and talk to myself back then, I would say, Stuart, young, young Stuart, young Stuart in almost middle school, 
what you've experienced is painful. It's hard. It's, it's, it's you know, be emotional. It's, it's a heartbreak, sure. But when you start extrapolating that to the, this eternal almost perspective, this like all of my life is shot, the one of me that's now, you know, years later, you know, married 20 years, this is 30 something years later, I would go back and I would say, man, that's not the end. You know, that's not, that's not the fullness of your life. What happened in this three week interval? So imagine the me, how me being married 20 years goes back and, and talks to me who's been you know, sort of kind of with a girlfriend for three weeks, how I would speak this life and perspective into me and say, you can't see it now, but I want you to know there's more to this story. Well, now multiply that times a billion trillion gazillion, and that's what the idea of having eternal perspective is, is that pain and suffering now is real God does not try to take away from that, right? I'm not trying to take away from that. But the idea of understanding that when we are facing the scariest moment of all of our lives, and that is the last few moments of our lives, the ability to offer, offer our life up to Jesus, knowing that what he's going to give us is eternal life, eternal life in which will eclipse any suffering, any part of this vapor we call life here and now. That's the mentality that Stephen seems to have. He willingly offers his life up. Now, lastly, let's look at one more part of this and close this out. Uh, and by the way, how, did, how does he do this? Colossians uh, 3 is another seated Christ verse. But listen to how I think Stephen grabs hold of this. It says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things above, not on earthly things. And I think that's what Stephen was doing. I think he had his mind and his heart set on eternal things. So he was able to not see the end of this life, but to see the larger perspective of the life God offers him. And that's a wonderful perspective, right? In the light of all the things going around us right now. Now, verse 60. He falls on his knees. He cries out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. Now, fell asleep here means he, he died. He was, he, was, he was no more. Now, the idea here, I want to put it one more word for us to have in our mind, is the idea of mercy. And I get this from James 2, verse 13, that says, Mercy triumphs over judgment. Now, we sing a song within the Radius uh, gathering often that, that, that we, we, re, we use this refrain from James. It's a wonderful, wonderful text. Um, but oftentimes, when we're singing it or thinking about it, we're basically proclaiming this reality of God that God's uh, mercy triumphs over judgment, and we're so thankful for that, right? But the James context is actually not talking exclusively about God. It's talking more in context about us, that in human-to-human -human interactions, our mercy for people should triumph over our judgment for them. Now, here's why this matters. In a culture that we have right now, where a lot of this is how the enemy is working with us, we are finding this temptation to fight for justice, right? To go like, how do we fight for justice? Social justice, where can we find any kind of push on that? And how do we solve it? And, and in saying this, I'm not demeaning the fight for social justice, but I'm also saying that, that this isn't the highest value in the kingdom of God that we are called to, uh, to, to in commission to live out uh, for the sake of God. And this text is one of these that would validate that, that, that viewpoint. Why? Because to, in, to inflict justice on someone for doing something wrong requires judgment. Now, judgment isn't wrong, but there are elements sometimes where we're called to, to make judgments but within our circle where we can be witnesses and we can make judgments based on what we know. If we take on the mantle of judging things we can't know anything about, now we have a problem. But even within the circle of what we feel like is in our radius and we can make those judgments, now these would have to be within the church, obviously. That's what 1 Corinthians 5 teaches. But when we're making these judgments in the small circle that we're allowed to make these types of judgments, it still doesn't uh, uh, mean that mercy doesn't triumph over the judgment. Right? Mercy is still the most powerful thing. And we want to be fighting for mercy to be shown, not for judgments to be made so that justice can ensue. That doesn't mean that justice, we don't want it. It just means our fight, our passion, our vigor needs to be for mercy. We want to show mercy as much as we can, as often as we can, because we have been shown such mercy from the Father. He, he relentlessly shows us mercy when He could make judgments and could inflict justice. But He doesn't. 
He's so merciful time and time again. And he asks us to follow suit with him in the book of James. And this is what Stephen does. Listen, let me give you the perspective. What's going on here? Let me, let me make sure you understand the variables here. Uh, Stephen is, being, is about to be stoned. Matter of fact, when it says this, he's in the midst of being stoned. Now, there are different types of, of stonings. This one does not seem to have the, um, the context of the type of stoning where you push someone off a cliff. So I'm going to show you another type of stoning that happens that feels like this is more likely what Stephen is doing. They have uh, decided that he's done something wrong. They're taking him out of the city. And now you have up to, you know, let's say 71 members of the Sanhedrin, plus the false witnesses that were raised, plus uh, anybody who's heard him that were witnesses to the times he's been teaching in, in, the, in the book of Acts or before, or earlier than Acts chapter even 6 or 7, we see the sermon. He was obviously saying things before then, and so anybody that's heard that could come along. And then you've got the accusers themselves, you know, that, that are the people that are the freedmen and the other different groups who've heard him talking. So you have what could have been 50 people easily, 100 people easily, if all the Sanhedrin didn't show up. You know, there's a lot of people in the crowd that could have been there willing to go walk out of the city and take place in ending the life of somebody they thought was blaspheming God. So to do this, they're going to walk out of the city and they're going to find a space and they're, they're going to pick up rocks. Now, generally, if you're going to bla- kill somebody for what you think is heresy or blasphemy, you're not picking up like a pebble. Right, you are picking up a, a sizable rock. You know, some of the stuff in the Mishnah actually teaches that if you are if you are doing the cliff type of thing, you push them off the cliff and you pick up a rock that uh, that two people have to be able to get. It has to be that big, and then they drop it on them. So you can imagine stoning had within its um, vision and intention certain death. Right, that was the the goal of stoning. People did survive stoning, but it was rare, and you would think it would be mostly miraculous if it happened that way. All the people around would have had to think they were dead, but they weren't. This happens actually with Paul. So the idea here is they're not doing the push off the cliff con, but they're doing the grab the rock as hard as you can, and imagine they are they are point blank right there surrounding Stephen. And it says he starts to be stoned. You know? So that means what you have is he's standing there, and they take the first couple stones, and the first few people that want to feel offended by him or do feel offended by him, they chunk those stones. All right? And they're throwing them at him. And I imagine that causes him to fall on his knees. Now, the next round of people come up, and now they've got their heavy stones. And now Stephen's more vulnerable. He's hurt. His life is leaving him to some degree. In his last few moments of life, on his knees, staring at a circle of people that all are holding stones, I would guess, the size of bricks. And they're, they're ready to throw, and they're ready to throw hard, and they think they're throwing for God or for their religion or for their religious beliefs. Stephen says to them, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. This is fascinating. You know, because the Lord (laughs) is now being asked by Stephen to push against the part of the Lord that is justice. Jesus wants justice. Jesus needs to be a judge. God is a judge. Judgment, justice, these are things of God. These are not bad things. They're just things that if he does them, it means mercy has to be moved out of the picture. The Lord's judgment, right? The, the Lord's justice means that the earth will be judged, people will be judged, and the option for merciful invitation into salvation is no more. So at the moment where Stephen is looking everybody in the eye and stones are about to be thrown that will end his life in the next few seconds, he could have said, Jesus, you just opened this window so that I could see you in heaven. Could you do one more thing for me? Could you do one more thing that, that should be in your character, Jesus? Could you turn these stones into, you know, cloth? Could you tell these people to be transported a mile away? Could you transport me a mile away? There's a hundred things he could have asked Jesus for that would have been appealing to the character and nature of God because God is just, right? God is a judge. But instead, what Stephen says is, don't hold this against them. Why? Because what Stephen wanted, 
And I would argue with the Christians around Stephen wanted because they don't, they don't protest this. This doesn't turn into a mob the next day saying like, down with the Sanhedrin. What I would say Stephen and other followers of Christ must have wanted is what Christ ultimately wants in this moment and in the moment we're in now. And that is this, his highest value in this moment as he enacts his will on earth cannot be judgment and must not be simply justice here and now. It must be truly that mercy triumphs over. Simply put, what does God want? He wants all men to be saved. That's what he wants. What does Stephen want? He wants what Jesus wants. So what does Stephen pray for? Stephen prays, Jesus, allow your judgment, allow your justice to be put on hold for now against these oppressors of mine because I want you to release that from them because I want what you want, Jesus. I want their souls to be forever with you in eternity, Jesus. That's what I want. And he prays that. Now, this might seem like just like, okay, what a random out there story. Uh, why would we ever do that? You know, where's the practical um, you know, checks and balances? Where is the practical kind of like, show me, weigh it out and show me that it really worked. You know, show me that it actually happened. And this story, it's not hard to find that. I don't think in our stories we're always going to see that. But I, here's all we got to say. There's a man who's either participating or overseeing the execution of Stephen, who is in, in earshot and eyesight of everything that is happening. His name is Saul. Do I need to say anything else? This man, Saul, who will become Paul, is the reason my life has been changed so much by Jesus because he is still affecting people to this day. This man who's, who I, I, I would put $100 on the table and tell you what Stephen did in his last dying moments, what Stephen was able to say, probably had profound effect on Saul's conversion and salvation into Jesus Christ. And who knows how many people have been eternally changed because Saul um, um, was affected by Stephen. Because Stephen decided to want what Jesus wants, mercy, forgiveness. Stephen wants his life to be used to bring people to the glory of God. So as we are confronted right now with a world that seeks uh, judgment, that seeks justice and has to make judgments in order to get that justice, may we find ourselves as people who prefer mercy. We don't disregard justice. We don't disregard judgment, but may we see that in the way of Christ, the mercy He wants to show even to the oppressor is, is triumphant, is, is the heart of Christ. He desires all people to be saved. So Radius Greenville, may we find ourselves with the same way of Stephen being true of us, that we would be people who put Jesus at the center, who are filled by the Spirit because of that, and boldly proclaim Jesus, and in doing so, await the day where we will see Jesus in due time. In the meanwhile, may we offer our lives freely to Christ, that if He wants us to go in any one way, in any one timing, for His glory and His purposes, that we would willingly hold our lives with open hands and say, you gave us life and you can take away this life for your glory. And lastly, as we see people around us suffering, and we see oppressors and victims and, and just evil and judgment and hurtful things, may we promote mercy because mercy triumphs over judgment.